So you heard my name, you're probably in the wrong room. You probably should have been seeing Thomas Vondra, which is a great speaker. So you have now like 30 seconds to switch room. But for those that are staying, thank you for coming. So I'm going to be talking about should I use JSON in PostgreSQL? As Jimmy said, my name is Boris Mejias. I used to be a solutions architect. I grow a little bit uh, gray hairs, and I'm a senior solution architect. But this title actually pisses off a lot of building architects because uh, you didn't study that when you're an engineer. And of course, I'm a holistic system software engineer because I like to see the things from the fundamental point of view of the interconnectedness. So I like to see it from the developer point of view, from the DBA point of view. I know that there are many application developers here, which is a great thing. I also, uh, what I really, really do is being an air guitar player. I enjoy doing that. Now, the title said, should I use JSON in PostgreSQL? Not should you use JSON. I'm not trying to convince you. So this is kind of a therapeutic session. So I want you to help me to answer this question for myself. So I am going to be happy at the end of the presentation because I will know a little bit more. You might be sharing the final thoughts, but I mean, it's, you're not forced to. Good. So when I dis uh, discussed this with my colleagues at ADB, they asked me, like, why on earth would you like to use JSON? We are a relational database. We just added this stuff because people wanted to use Mongo, so we wanted to attract some people. I said, well, the thing is that I want to have, my starting point of view, a schema freedom. Yes, not a schema less, so a schema freedom. This is, for me, the main point. I think that is Tomasz Garik Masaryk would have been using Postgres 100 years ago when he was the first president of Czech Republic. He wanted to have some freedom from some oppressing state, but he, did, he didn't want to have anarchy. That would be a schema less. He wanted to have some freedom within a certain structure. So this is combining the schema freedom from JSON together with the structures from relational database. So this is what we are going to investigate together. All right, so typical example of a database, relational database, you have a document. A document has plenty of stuff, like an identifier, a name, an owner of the object, which is the document. The creation time, when it was modified, a size, and a type. All documents have this. But if you think about images, they also have like a height, height and a width. So they add some extra stuff, but these kind of properties are not present in other type of documents like a text file or Markdown or PDF. Now, if you have an image which has a position, you will have latitude and longitude as well. But not all the images have that. If you start having other type of images, which are like composing 24 or 25 images per second, you have video, and then you have also audio and frames per second and length. So some of the objects are going to have these attributes, some others are going to have these attributes, and some others are going to have a lot of stuff. So you start accumulating things in a lot of empty columns. Yeah? So this is super bad, and it's not efficient in storage and all this kind of stuff. So what is clear here from the design point of view is that you have a core part of your object plus some extra attributes. And the way that people used to solve this, this is in like in 20 more years, what Simon was mentioning, People are going to look at like the archaeology of relational database. Like, ha, ah, in that time they needed to do things like the entity attribute value pattern. It's terrible, it's super ugly, this kind of stuff. So it is just for archaeology, but we are going to refer to it. So you need to have another table, which is going to have a reference to the document ID, and it's going to call all the attributes for that document, and whether it's a string or a numeric value or a Boolean. And then a property ID, which is going to say like, this is length, or this is uh, audio format. So basically, this is kind of like a, a key value pair in a JSON object, where you have the key and the value, which can take these three things, and actually other stuff. So it's much better to do it than JSON stuff. And the other problem with this one is that for this particular document ID, your information is going to be spread across this table. I, I, I don't like this stuff. So that's why, instead of putting this kind of stuff, we are going to put a JSON object there, yeah? This is your dynamic part. This is your schema freedom, together with the relational stuff. So it's combined. If somebody saw um, yesterday the presentation by Jonathan Katz, he was talking about PG Vector being the new JSON. That's because you can combine PG Vector with relational stuff. Here we are combining JSON with relational stuff. This is the, actually his metaphor. Now, here are your attributes, and that's your schema freedom. So JSON, what I, the other thing that I like from JSON is that the name is kind of like a tough name. It's like, here comes JSON, you know? So it looks like this. 
I, I made it by hand because actually a JSON object can be in, on paper. The representation, a binary representation, is what goes into the computer. But this is a JSON object. It's human readable. So it's super nice to have it like this. And I have some example here with latitude and longitude. This is a particular place in Patagonia. So you can take a picture and then try to figure out where it is. And you have here, for instance, like a video with an interview to a guy named Slonik, and which is talking about Postgres. These are the tags. And you can see that one value can actually have an array inside. So it gives you a lot of dynamicity, this JSON object. Super cool. And you can put everything into one column in Postgres. So let's see how we're going to do it. So a lot of people uh, do the de development of uh, the architecture in containers or the cloud. What I like is bare metal. That's for me the perfect thing uh, to have. Um, so we're going to talk about some examples with metal bands. So I did start some doing some research on JSON objects. You can download that from the internet. And then you can have a lot of definition of metal bands that are described like this. You have an ID, a name, the genre. You can put like a type of music, but genre sounds kind of more like a uh, elite. You know? So the genre, which can be multiple genre, the theme of the music, and plenty of other stuff. This is a very good band from Sweden uh, that actually had the name before the, the movie, by the way. So, it's super easy. You have a, an, a table called bands with one column called band, and then you have a JSON object. This is one approach. Might not be the best one, but it's one approach. And this is what we say, should I use JSON in Postgres? Might be that the answer is yes, but not like this. Let's see why. So this is kind of like a um, spoiler. So you do it like this, create table, bands, and a band, and JSON B. So we are also going to be talking about data types here. This is the binary representation, but it's actually the B is for best. Yeah, the best way of doing JSON is in, in Postgres. Metal bands with a unique ID. So we can have a unique ID, and we do it like this. You can create an index in a JSON B object that takes one of the field, yeah, and we are going to be seeing what is this double head here, and what we are going to say is that this is a unique index, so nobody can have exactly uh, the uh, two, two nodes cannot have exactly the same value here. So you can guarantee this in JSONB in, in Postgres. So this is already something super cool. Yeah? So you can have objects that are unique. All right. So other examples, uh, because uh, musicians, they play uh, music, and they record the music, and they create albums. In the albums, you have information like the idea of the album plus the idea of the band. So here's exactly the same. So all refer to the band Avatar. All right? These are some of the albums that they have played. And in this one, for instance, the Feathers and Flesh, they have uh, songs with philosophical titles like I don't know what I don't know. It's a cool song. You have to check that track. All right. So what we have here is actually a design of entity relationship, a band that has multiple albums. Yeah? The problem is that we have here a band ID, and we have no way to refer to this inside that object. So that's a problem. So should I use JSON in PostgreSQL? Yes but not like this. So let's fix that. And we go from the point of view of having a metal band with a unique ID to having metal bands with a primary key. And this is the moment that we start splitting your JSON object into some columns that are shared by all the uh, objects and some things that are dynamic. So in our case, we are going to put the entire band except for the ID, which is going to be just a primary key like any good relational database. All right. So now we have the albums, which actually they all have exactly the same, so I'm not going to use JSON here. So I'm not going to use JSON just for the sake of using JSON, but just because I want to have the anonymity here, not here. So now I can have a foreign key. All right, so uh, my design is now fixed. I split a little bit of more columns. I have two columns here, four columns here, and this one is a foreign key to the previous one. Now, uh, people listen to music, and they like to share music in the same way that we share uh, our knowledge of Postgres. So people like to write reviews. Yeah? And the reviews can have a variety of information, like a title of the review, some tags, and some other kind of things. So obviously, this is going to be written like an object, because you have dynamicity. And we can see that in JSON object, you have scalar values, like uh, these values that can be either integers or text. Yeah? But you can also have uh, some arrays, which are not present here. But then you can see that the content is going to be something really, really long. So we are going to do something else with that text afterwards. But because the, um, 
review can have multiple things. What we are going to do is that there are two important things here. One is the ID of the review, which has to be unique, so we are going to put it into a primary key, a reference to the album that is doing the review, and all the rest is going to be in a JSON object, so we can do whatever we want with it afterwards. So now we complete our beautiful bare metal entity relationship, which looks like a relational uh, stuff. It just has some schema freedom here and there. Yeah? Good. So, JSON in Postgres. And in this case, I'm going to be making a little bit of difference between not just the concept of JSON object, but also the data type JSON B for best. All right. So, access to JSON or JSON B. This is done with these three type of things. This is an arrow. This is an arrow with a double head. And this is a symbol that means that something is contained into something, yeah? What you do is that you pass an object at this side, always a JSON object or a JSON B object. You specify a field, and you're going to get either an object or text. So, when you get an object arrow field, is always an object. But if you want to look inside that object, then what you're going to get is the text. And the text can be another JSON object, or an array, or a number, uh, number, but you have to convert it, or a Boolean, and all this kind of stuff. So this is the important thing, because a lot of people get uh, some trouble with the double arrow or not. And the important thing is the output here. And this one is for making comparison. When you do where clause, I want to see, like, if this object is contained by this other object and it's going to return a Boolean, true or false. So this, you can also use it for where clauses. Now you can also access this with a path. How do you remember the symbol for the path? Because it's not, uh, is uh, by thinking that this is kind of like a map and then you have the streets and this is a path, right? And then the arrow is exactly the same thing. Either one head arrow or double head arrow. You get an object at one side, and at the other side, you get an array of text. Because the array of text is going to be your path. Yeah? What does it mean a path? For instance, in an object, I'm going to go inside the bands. And then I want to get the first value of that um, array. But now the first, no, actually the number one. So in, in SQL, arrays, by definition, in the standard, start with the number one. Whereas in JSON, start with the number zero. But Postgres wants to be as standard as possible, so therefore, objects in the JSONB start with zero in Postgres. So this is going to be actually the second element. All right. How do you update JSON values? Yeah. So it's different between JSONB and JSON, because the data type JSON is just storing this thing as like one chunk of text, and it's going to return it to you. So the only way to update a JSON value, data type JSON, is like when you upgrade a Mac uh, computer. You throw it away, and you buy a new one. In this case, it's the same. You throw away your JSON object, and you insert a new one. JSONB offers you the possibilities of only removing one element or adding another element or multiple ones. In the end, it's still in the binary. It's going to replace the whole stuff, but um, the whole row. But at least in terms of operations, it gives you this possibility. So how do you add and remove fields? There's only two operators that you need to remember. Well, actually, two operators and one function. When I show you the operators, your conclusion is going to be like, meh, which is kind of this phase. You only need these two things. This is to concatenate, and this is to uh, subtract. So how do you edit in JSON? It's super simple. OK? That's, that's what you need to do. Uh, how do you replace a field with a function? It is with this nice function that tells you JSON B is not JSON because you cannot do it with JSON. It has to be with JSON B. You pass your object, you give it a path. Remember the path that we give with the uh, string, and you have the arrow. And then, oops, you have the new value. Yeah? There is an extra parameter that by default is true, which means if the field is specified by this path doesn't exist, it creates it or not. By default, it's going to create it all the time, but sometimes you want to modify a value only if it exists before. So you, if you want to do that, you put here false. OK, so I'm giving you a lot of uh, information. I think it's a little bit too boring to just look at slides. So I think that now it is uh, time to do some demo stuff, because demos are always cooler than just uh, slides. So I have some uh, code already prepared, because I'm terrible typing when people are looking at me. 
Uh, so, um, so don't don't look. No, I mean don't look at me. Look at the slides. Yes. So I can get the feeling that I'm alone. And so I'm going to connect to a database called. Can you can you read this? Can you read on the back? I always wanted to do that, but I've never been in a, such a large room for a concert. So you can read on the back. Yes. Good. So I'm connecting to host Prague, database Prague, and I'm the user Slonic. So let me give you a little bit of information here. How do you read this? This is version 16. So I'm going to use at a certain point some of the new stuff of SQL in version 16. And one thing that you can already identify if you know, if you don't know, this is the moment to get this information. This arrow here, it means that I'm not a super user. I'm a regular user, okay? I'm user Slonic, which is, doesn't have the attribute of being a super user, so security first. Now, what you can define per user, because you don't want to use the public um, uh, schema as your default stuff, you can always, uh, no, it's not set, but show the search path. You can define it per user. So in my case, I have one, uh, haha, a one um, schema name called Metal, yeah, where I'm going to do some exercises. And by default, when I connect, this is my search path immediately. I don't have to go through the public stuff. So if I do select from artists, I'm going to go through metal.artist or bands and stuff like that. So that's a good thing, also for security reasons. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to check Republic. <laughs> uh, how, many, how many bands are in this database coming from these three different countries? Czech Republic, Germany, and Italy. Why, why did I pick this, these three countries? Any, anybody has a guess? Exactly, last three PGConf uh, Europe were in these three countries. So um, what I'm doing here, I'm just counting them from the table bands, and I'm going to take the text from that country and comparing it with these three. So it can be any of these three, yeah? And I get 5,405 uh, bands. Now this is not enough information. What we want to do is to see per country which one has uh, more uh, value? So, anybody can get a guess where are there more metal bands, either in Czech Republic, in Germany, or in Italy? So what I'm going to do is Germany, I think. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to group the results by band. So you can use all these kind of things inside the values of JSON. You don't need to have everything split into columns. JSON gives you a lot of possibilities. And then I'm going to order by, by the count. And it is, of course, Germany, the cradle of power metal. You have uh, super good bands like uh, Blind Guardian or Halloween, which... <laughs> okay, so then Italy, which also have a lot of uh, power metal. And actually that, that explains why I didn't have so many good examples with the bands from Czech Republic, because there are only 462 metal bands according to my research. Uh, but I have some, some important examples because I, I listen to plenty of bands um, just to give you some information. Good. So now you know a little bit more about metal music. Uh, so if you don't learn anything about JSON, at least you, you get something about uh, metal. So this is one of the band. It's called Forgotten Silence. Nice name. Actually, when I was listening to them, I, so you see this information is kind of like this. Yeah? Um, when I was listening to them, I thought there was like two or three bands. And I'm going to explain you why I got this information. So what I did here with this result, I did select band from bands where the name is Forgotten Silence. It was an ugly result, where we want to see something more prettier for some uh, geek definition of pretty, okay? So this is what we call pretty, JSON B pretty. So the same result that we got, and I'm going to put it in a pretty format, and we got this. This is much more readable, you see? You can read this. And this is why I thought that this was kind of a Three different bands, because they're actually in the genre. You have experimental, progressive, death metal, folk, and jazz. And the themes are Egyptian mythology, oriental tales, dreams, love, desire, sadness, and hate. I didn't go into most of those uh, songs before this presentation, otherwise I would be shouting at you. But um, you can see how music can be really emotional. stuff. That's why I get so passionate about it, uh, like Postgres. Good. So this is how you actually access the, the data. Super cool. But I have other examples. Uh, I give uh, this presentation also uh, with a little bit of differences in Sweden. Sweden has a lot of metal bands, really great stuff, like Avatar that I was mentioning to you. But also Ambush. And we're going to see Ambush um, 
here. Let, let me, okay, this is the way of getting with the path. Let's go directly with ambush. So what I'm going to do here is select band, and then I'm going to have here the path. You see this hash thing with the, with the streets? And then I'm going to get not the object, but the text of the theme. Yeah, and then I'm going to see, ah, oh, this is um, for the metal band ambush. And I got two results. So I don't know whether this is the Swedish band or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an extra um, where clause here. So I'm going to say the same thing, but I'm going to add, and I want to have that the country is Sweden. Yep. And then I get these three values here. So it's an array, yeah? But the array is being represented as a text, yeah? Which is not very nice. And the problem with the database is that it sent me some weird characters here. Freedom. Uh, freedom. And you see this kind of repetitive thing come in my presentations. I, I kind of like freedom. Postgres is, by the way, free software, if you didn't know. Not just open source, it's free software. Right, so uh, free as in freedom, not as in beer. By the way, uh, lager beer, Pilsner, was invented here in Czech Republic, yeah, in the town Pils. Good, so I want to fix this freedom, and I show you already how to update um, the, um, the JSON object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this one, yeah, here, back. So I see that the ID is this value, so I'm going to use that ID for, oops, I already have the updated. So I'm going to update the bands, and I'm going to set the band to the result of calling JSONB set with this path, which is theme number two. So remember, this is zero, one, two. And I'm going to change that value for freedom, not freedom pipe. Yeah? And then I'm going to say false because I don't want to create if this uh, thing didn't exist. Good, so now I can go again and then ask for the value, and now I have freedom, and I fix the JSON object. Ta -da. Good, that's the proper freedom, not freedom pipe. Right, good. So let me get back here to the slides. So what about search? Because I did some where clause, and it can do kind of a scan of the whole thing. So in metal music, we like music to be heavy, but we also want it to be fast. So if JSON is not fast, I'm not going to use this kind of stuff. Can I index then JSON fields? Well, you can, but it's very limited. So you better don't do it. So it's better to answer this question. Can I index JSON B fields for best? Yeah? Yes, I can. So let's do that. Let's do that. First of all, I show you that JSON object can have either scalar values, like Boolean numbers or text, or it can have other values that like composite can be arrays or other JSON objects again. If it is a scalar, so a single value, use B3, the good old B3 is enough, and this is going to work very well. How do you do it? Well, you, in the same example that we, we saw, I already showed you a little bit, like create a unique index. It's the same thing, but you don't have, to, you have the unique key. You just say create index, by well, the name of your index, on this um, table using this expression, expression. You see the double parenthesis is because this is the result of this expression, and the expression is with the text. So here you have to be careful if you put here one single arrow is going to try to index the object, and it's not going to work. What you want to have is to index the text, what is inside. Yeah, very important. Now, this also works with JSON data type. I put it very small, so if you cannot read it, don't worry. You better forget about it, because it's terrible. I mean, it's going to give you some confusion if you have twice the value. But uh, so think about JSON B, yeah, JSON B in this case. Good. Composite values, then you're going to use gene. Why gene? because it tastes good. And it means generally inverted index, so it's going to go inside the JSONB object or the array, and it's going to point things out of it inversely, and then it's going to build your uh, index, and then you're going to be able to find the stuff that are inside your objects, okay? Right, so how do you do it? Well, you do it like this. For instance, you remember that the genre, this was a, an array, so it is a composite value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the index, and then I'm going to say, using gene, and then I pass the expression. So it's kind of exactly the same. I'm going to upload the slides, by the way. So you don't need to take pictures of everything. Now, if you have a text, remember the review? The review was having a long description about what is going to happen about this album and telling you the story of the album. Then it's better to use something like three grams. If you have more questions about three grams, you can ask Jimmy, because Jimmy is an expert of uh, full text search, so 
there are some uh, presentations of him also on the, on the net. Right, how you do this, this is um, also not just for JSON objects, you can do it for columns that are text, it's very good. I, I remember we did once a project of people that were moving from Lucene uh, to Postgres because TreeGram was much faster than Lucene search and it was immediate. You didn't have to wait until some seconds to re-index some new stuff. So if you want to have indexes that are super fast for text, use this. So first you create a extension called pg underscore tree grams with the schema, don't do it in the public. And then you create your index, same thing, your name of your index on this table, using gene, because in, with the gene, we're indexing what is inside, we pass this, um, function here, which is going to analyze and then get the distance uh, with three letters and stuff like that. So it's going to also search for similarities and things like that. Super cool. So this is for the review content. I'm not going to go into all this stuff. This is kind of, I'm giving you recipes. If you have a JSON uh, object that has a single value, the recipe is to use a B tree. If you have a JSON object with a composite value, like JSON array, then use gene, because gene is meant for those kind of stuff. If you have text, then the recipe says use three grams, right? So this is kind of some hints. I'm opening you the door to, and my goal is not to tell you everything, but to open the door so that you go and search for more stuff. All right, so I keep on uh, this, explaining this stuff to my colleagues at EDB, and they ask me, okay, 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 yeah, all fun and all this stuff, but JSON is all this dynamic data type and all these kind of things. We want to have like strict data types. That's why we have column, because in column, everything has to be an integer, whereas in JSON, you can put whatever you want. So the question was, can you force a data type inside JSON field? Of course, this is a theoretical uh, session, so I convert this into the dark mode of a, uh, can I, force a data type inside a JSON field. And I want you to find the answer together with me. So let's go and check, what are the possibilities? Remember, don't do it in JSON, do it in JSON B, yeah? And I'm telling you multiple times that because by repetition you actually kind of build the networks in your brain, you can remember everything. But there are always some metaphors that you can use in order to remember. And one of the metaphors that I'm going to tell you to remember whether it's JSON or JSON B is to listen to Jason Becker which is a great music uh, musician. He doesn't play guitar anymore because he has some illness in his, his body, but he recorded some very good albums, uh, instrumental stuff, together with um, Martin Friedman. Super good stuff. I recommend you listen to Perpetual Burn, very good album, Ex especially, well, the, the title, Perpetual Burn itself, Altitudes and Air. Those are really three great tracks. You can listen to them, uh, and then you can tell me what it is. So there is a possibility to provide feedback on the, um, uh, you can also tell me what do you think about the music uh, and the feedback. It's always good to know more bands are like, ah, you like Jason Baker, maybe you should also listen to these other people. So Jason Baker, Jason B, this is what you have to remember. So let's come back to the other question after this small uh, break. Can I force data types inside a JSON field? Remember that we have an index. So we can create indexes for a field. Can we do something special with the index? When you have an index, you can also say, I'm going to index the result of this expression. In the expression, you can do a cast of a data type. Uh -huh. So what we are going to do is using a cast. I'm going to create an index, for instance, for the review. Remember in the review, there was a score from zero to one. Yeah, because some people want to have it from 1 to 10, the other one from 0 to 20, so you don't know. So we um, are going to normalize, not in the sense of uh, normalizing an, an entity relationship, but normalizing to, from 0 to 1 like vectors. Yeah, canonical vector normalization. So we're going to use uh, double precision. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the text out of that score value, and we're going to do a cast to double precision. So we're not going to just force the data type, we're also going to have an index for it. So we can even search for, give me all the albums that are larger than 0 0.8. Super cool. And inside the JSON object, you don't need a column for this anymore. Now the other thing, the other thing that you can do is to add a constraint. Yeah? So if you don't want the index, says you, I just want to have the constraint, you can do it like this. You say, alter table, reviews, add a constraint, I want to have a numeric score. I don't want to have anything else than a numeric stuff. And they say, check, pg underscore input is valid. So I want to see that the input that I get here is valid or not. And I pass the text here, 
and I'm going to cast it into double precision. Watch out about the single quotes. And this is going to validate whether, and what I'm inserting is a valid um, number. So let, let's do it. Yes, I already went through many, many slides, so let's see, here. Uh, here. I'm not going to do the index. Let me do, let me do here this one, the constraint first. This, it's going to fail the constraint if I have some values already that are not integers. So let me do it here. Oops, that's not what I want. Tuck, tuck. Uh, okay, so alter table, reviews, add constraint, and then check uh, PG input is valid. Review, uh, this is the field that I want to have, and I want to have that as double precision. I save and execute it, and I change my definition of the table. So let's look at that. Uh, definition of the table, reviews. And I have now, well, I have an ID, which is the review, the album where it's referring to, and I have the JSON B, which is the review. And then I have a constraint here that tells me that it has to be a double precision text, okay? All good there. So what I'm going to try to do now is to insert a value of somebody who is reviewing an album, and when it's, it didn't like it at all, oh, I need to again remove this, check. Insert into reviews, this is the value of the ID, which is referring to the first album that is in the uh, database, and this, this is a bad album, it's the title, it's terrible, I'm going to score zero for this one. Yeah? But you put it on text, so this is not valid. Yeah? So we're going to see whether it's possible or not to do this kind of stuff. Oh, I tried to execute this and said, no, you cannot do this because, um, wait, wait, operation reviews, validate here, Vi violates the check constraint numeric score. So you can actually force data types inside a JSON object without losing the dynamicity of the, of the object itself. Super cool. So let's, let's put the index as well, so that we also have some search capabilities with it. So I, I prefer this one when I, when I know that I'm going to search for a score, right? Create the index. Now let's try to insert the same thing, but instead of putting zero, let's try to insert a, a real zero, like this. Yep, yep, uh, tuck. Yep, now insert it, good. So my chain constraint and my index works, super cool. Okay, but I see that I have some extra time, so let me show you. Uh, do you know, the, I'm, I'm editing here uh, with PSQL with my favorite text editor, so I did backslash E, and I jumped to my favorite text editor, and I define VI, yeah? VIM, actually, because it's improved, yeah? Uh, thank you, thank you. So, did you, did, have you ever seen the, the movie um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Do you know the, the nice who says, me? Do you know that you can ask me to be I? So let's see what happens. Me. Well, when there's an expression. Do you demand a strawberry? <laughs> okay, well, that was uh, the uh, moment of uh, the conference. Okay. okay, so let's come back to, to the slides. So I managed to force the data type. So I'm still getting even more and more and more convinced about this uh, usage of JSON in Postgres, I hope that you're getting, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I would say, convinced you. Uh, you are free to do it, I mean, you can, you can decide. I love freedom, so you're free to do it. You just have the more information now, you can decide whether you want to use it or not. So what about SQL JSON? Because there are some new stuff, and I'm not going to explain all the, the stuff, but I want to show you this one in particular. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to use this new thing, which is th that I have a JSON object here, and I can say, is this a JSON? And then in particular, I want to have a scalar value inside that value. So before we used to use uh, PG underscore type of, yeah, to see what are the values that are inside the fields of JSON, because sometimes you want to know what it is inside in order to be able to take an action or not. So in this case, what I can ask is whether this thing that is inside this field is JSON, and in particular, whether it's a scalar or not. Can anybody see the problem here? A scalar value can also be text or Boolean. So I'm not forcing the data type, I'm just forcing the fact that it's a scalar. So this type of solution, okay, was a good attempt, but it's only good to be buried in the church of Setlick. Setlick. I cannot pronounce Setlick. 
Sedlec. It's a church made out of bones, super nice, super beautiful, near Prague, about uh, 150 kilometers from here. So if you have some time after the conference, it's decorated with bones. Okay. So it's not good for a solution, but it gives us some other alternative. So let me ask again, what about SQL JSON? Well, remember that we have this definition of the object bands where the genre was multiple things. If it is multiple things, it's because I want to put them in an array. So I don't want to have a band that has a text instead of an array. If it has one genre only, then I want it to be inside an array so that all the objects are always in the same kind of harmony. Yeah? So I mean, we like brutality and speed and heaviness in metal, but it needs to have some harmony as well. So JSON, SQL JSON, we can do this. If the genre is JSON array, then we accept it. We are going to have this constraint. So it is still useful. It's not useful for a specific data type, but it's useful for a sort of type, yeah? So a JSON array. So uh, let's add it. Let me see this. Tick, tick, tick. Uh, up here. Alter table bands add constraint genre array is the name of the constraint. Uh, I want to check that the genre is a JSON array. Okay, works. So let, let's test it. Insert into, don't look at me, look at the screen. Uh, insert into bands. And then the values is going to be, well, let's speak about a random number, uh, 1918, which is the foundation of uh, the Czech Republic after the First World War, when the Tomasz uh, Garik Masaryk was uh, the first president. And then I'm going to add the object, which is the band which has a name, I need to put this as a field. The name is going to be, I cannot pronounce it, but let's, so that you can search for the name of the church. And if it's a church with a lot of bones, probably this is playing the death metal. Okay, so I put a, oh, this is a comma, it's not a comma, it's a colon. Yeah, death metal, it's not an array, it is one single value. Oh, complaints. No, this is a syntax type, uh, wait. Am I missing something here? No. Oh, thank you. Like that. Yep. Good. Now I said, oh, error. Your genre actually violates a constraint because it's not an array. So it works. Cool. Let's fix it. An array looks like this with one element. Okay, I tested this with the wrong number. So let's add another random number. <coughs> Good, it works. Nice, so now we have uh, <laughs> metal influence. Um, sorry. There is more. <laughs> I gave you some recipes. <laughs> so we have a book. <laughs> it's called The Administration Cookbook. I'm super happy to be part of uh, this uh, new uh, edition together with um, Jimmy and Johnny, which are here. Vivor is here as well, no? Somewhere. No, he's signing books outside. Uh, so, um, the definition of a JSON objects here and how to use them, it is also explained in this book as one of the recipe. And uh, so uh, we also have some stuff about table partitioning and some other interesting things. So it might be useful if you want to check the book. So closing words. I know that people in, well, let's start again. What we wanted to do here, it was to know whether should I use JSON as a global concept of JSON, regardless of the data type or not, in PostgreSQL. So let's see what are the arguments to convince myself whether I used to use it or not. And I know that people in the, in the UK, when there's something is good, they say like, oh, it's not too bad. So they would say like, oh, the support for JSON is not too bad. If you ask somebody from the US, they would say, oh, it's awesome, awesome. For some reason, how is the coffee? Awesome. But in this case, I really want to make the point that the support for JSON in Postgres is awesome. Yeah, I mean it. I'm from Chile, so I can decide which one of the two I'm going to, to mention. I, well, at least I believe it. It's my, my personal point of view. Some people want to see it as a schema-less, but we saw that this is not what we want. We don't want anarchy. We want schema freedom. Yes? Another argument for using JSON. Remember to use the JSON data type. Listen to JSON Baker if you want to. And remember that this is the data type because it offers you a lot more possibilities than the plain JSON stuff. 
If you're going to use uh, search, it's better to index your JSON objects. And the recipe is that if you want to insert single values, use B trees. If you want to insert arrays or JSON objects inside JSON, use gene. Or if you want to insert the, uh, index the entire object as once, you use gene. If you want to drink gene, do it after you do all the changes in the database. Otherwise, you're going to produce some uh, problems. Yeah? So, and if you want to use uh, text fields that are long, especially for reviews and, and, and stuff like that, use three grams. So I think that these are enough arguments for me to answer the question, should I use JSON or not in PostgreSQL? And I'm pretty convinced. If you are still doubting whether I'm convinced or not, meet me afterwards at the coffee break. You can ask me. We can have a discussion and, 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 and have a good chat. So thank you very much, and hail Slonic. But you don't have to wait. You could ask now. <laughs> Questions? Anyone? They're all convinced. Okay. Who are these avatar people? Sweden's rising force is Ingwe Malmsteen. <laughs> yeah, the album from uh, Ingwe Malmsteen is called Rising Force. No, but Avatar is um, it's a band that they play different type of music, and uh, I like them a lot. This, this is one of the new good bands from Sweden, actually. Another one is uh, Opeth. You don't say Opeth, you say Opeth. Yeah? Okay, another question there. This is a long room. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Boris. Mm -hmm. um, you have shown uh, how to do schema validation within the, uh, the JSON objects, um, manually with de defining check constraints. Yeah. And um, I'm, um, th th there is a standard called uh, JSON schema, um, where you can really describe a schema for a JSON document. And I'm aware of at least one Postgres extension implementing that standard where you can formally define uh, a schema that a JSON needs to, um, um, to match and use that for uh, validation of the, uh, um, uh, the value in, within Postgres. But I'm not... Uh, I don't know what the current state of these extensions are. Okay. Do you know the name of this extension? No, I'm sorry. But okay. I can yeah. look it up. Yeah. So there, there are a few things that I added here in this slide, and they were provided by people who added feedback of the presentation. And then um, I improved the presentation thanks to that feedback. So um, I'm going to search for that, and I might include it in the next uh, presentation. So thank you. Yeah. So he's describing a way of uh, doing the schema definition within uh, the JSON object itself, instead of just doing it manually by adding some uh, check constraint and then adding some indexes and then also putting some columns outside. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for this, uh, Boris. Have, have you looked at performance impacts of you know you using JSON um, storage formats uh, compared to the regular storage formats? Yes. So. Uh, JSON itself, uh, with, without the B, it's, it includes everything of your objects. So when you want to have your JSON store and then you need to return them to some certain API with exactly the same amount of spaces and all the stuff, it just wants to store it like that. So it uses more space than JSON B. Now the JSON B is also going to compress some of this stuff as, as much as possible and it's also going to be um, toasted. So it's also going to be compressed. And people used to compare that with plain um, columns, which has metadata, so then obviously the columns are using less space. However, the type of problems that you have to solve with JSON objects are kind of the entity attribute value thing, and if you look at how much storage they need, you have a reference column, you have the name of the properties in a different column, you have a column in between that does all the foreign keys, actually it is more efficient to have a JSON object in one single place than having all this value for the entity attribute value. So in terms of performance, it's also much faster to do it with JSON object than with the entity attribute value. So when you compare, don't compare just to, I uh, have one JSON object and I put it either in JSON or in columns. No, think about the entire design of the solution and then see the alternative of having this relationship in multiple tables or just having them all together in one JSON object. That would be my advice when you do the comparison. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I have one. <laughs> okay. 
So when you update an element inside the JSON with JSON B set, and let's say your JSON B value is like 200 megabytes, does it write 200 megabytes every time you update it? Yes. Yeah. So that's something that you should consider. So, for instance, if your way of updating your JSON um, object is by updating scalars, which are very small, Every time that you modify that scalar, you have to rewrite all the rest of the object itself. So that will be a candidate for saying, this scalar value, I should better put it into a column that is going to be more efficient to update every time instead of touching the entire object all the time. So you always have to try to find uh, some possibilities for, do I need this freedom or not? If I can put this into a column, and it's going to be more efficient, they just, you just do it in a column. You don't have to be kind of a strict like, no, I just want JSON or just want columns. Yeah, but that's uh, one, of the, one of the drawbacks of JSON. There's a question there. Thank you. Follow up on uh, your remark, because uh, suppose you have a, a row in a table, mm -hmm. and you update the row, and Postgres always makes a new row, right? Yep. So, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. Now, if you use toasted values, then the reference to the toast is going to be remain the same, isn't it? Or am I wrong here? I need to test this. I need to check this. Wait. Uh, video recording, please uh, skip this part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check that, and I'm going to, I promise you I'm going to write a blog post to answer this question, because I, I always wanted to do this, but uh, um, to check this with the toast table, because I think it's more efficient when, when you put it into the toast stuff. If it is, if it doesn't go into toast, it's small enough to write it multiple times. But if it goes to toast, I need to check whether it's efficient or not. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to, to write something. Good, thanks. We have time for one more question. Here, Jimmy. I didn't remember well, but I only know that there is some like differences between null is where is the null like a JSON or null where is null inside uh, the JSON like and any object inside yep. or there is uh, some problems with this to understand and to compare it, but I know remember not well. Yeah, it's better then to check the documentation because there are multiple cases. In the new way of uh, working with this, uh, JSON objects in Postgres 16, you also have the possibility to investigate whether it's a JSON is null or not. There are also other ways of finding out whether the null values are added or not. Um, but in, it is a matter of uh, really looking at um, your um, definition of your schema within the JSON. Because in most of the cases, if you don't have the value, you don't want to put a null. That's the advantage of having a JSON object, because you only put the fields that you need. So if you're going to have a JSON object with 100 fields, two has a value, and 98 has null, then why you have a JSON object? That would be the same of having a columns, 100 columns. But uh, yes, the way of comparing the value of null inside a JSON object, because it's coming as an output of a scalar value, is not exactly the same as comparing null, which is in a column. But it's better to check the documentation every time because it depends on the operation that you're doing, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Great talk. Thank you very much, Boris. Thank you.